Hello, and thank you for listening to the AT Tapes, a podcast from the Journal of Athletic Training. The goal of this podcast is to interview researchers and clinicians on current topics facing athletic trainers and discuss how we can utilize best practices to improve patient outcomes. My name is Lizzie Elder, and I will be your host for this podcast. I'm the Athletic Training Program Director and an Associate Professor at the University of Alabama, and I have a research interest in shoulder and elbow injury prevention in youth overhead athletes. You can follow me on Twitter at eeelder85. Before getting started on today's episode, I wanted to remind everyone that all content from JAT is open access, meaning it is free of charge to all readers thanks to funding from the National Athletic Trainers Association. In today's episode, we have Dr. Chris Coons from Michigan State University joining us to discuss interventions in ACL reconstructed patients and some of his recent research on using wearables to assess and promote physical activity in these patients. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lizzie. Thanks for having me. So we're excited to have Chris here today to talk to us. And before we start uh, going up, on the discussion about his research, um, we want to learn a little bit more about you. So Chris, why don't you tell us about your educational background? Sure. So uh, I was a biology major at Boston University and uh, probably wasn't going to class as much as I should have and wasn't doing as well as I I should have. And uh, I had a little bit of a, a moment with my parents where they told me I needed to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I know this is a little stereotypical, but I like sports and I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, but that probably wasn't in the cards. And so I I looked around at my opportunities at BU and found that we just happened to have a really strong kind of nationally recognized athletic training program and was fortunate enough to go meet with uh, Sarah Brown and uh, Mark Larson, uh, who are uh, kind of program director and and clinical education coordinator at the time at uh, BU. And uh, they were nice enough to take a chance on a student who maybe wasn't doing as well as he should have. And from there, it, uh, you know, it was like kind of love at first uh, ankle tape, I guess. I don't know. But um, uh, I really kind of uh, enjoyed the clinical side of practice uh, from day one. But I always had kind of a nagging feeling that, uh, you know, biology and sort of the science basis was uh, where my interest really lied. Uh, and so then I went to the University of North Carolina for my master's in athletic training. And there I was able to get a firsthand kind of experience with what research and athletic training look like. Uh, and uh, it was pretty clear from the beginning of my experience there that that was going to be the direction that my career was going to take. Uh, and so I had some good mentorship from Steve Zinder and, and Troy Blackburn when I was at uh, UNC, and, and they pushed me uh, towards attending uh, University of Virginia for my PhD, uh, where I worked with Joe Hart and Jay Hurdle, Sue Saliba, who are all great scholars in our field. And uh, that's where my research agenda really started to form. So um, I became interested in you know, post ACL reconstruction outcomes, uh, kind of novel assessment tools, um, and kind of integrating technology into assessment of, of patients who are uh, going through a, a pretty tough time in their in their you know lifespan or you know athletic life. So um, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty good overview. And then from there, I I took a job at the University of Miami for two years, and after that, came up here to Michigan State, and uh, I've been here for going on. Uh, I guess I'm going into my seventh year now. So. You also left off in a very important factoid that um, while at UNC Chapel Hill, that's where we met. Yeah, absolutely. No, we had a we had a, a great time at, at UNC, and uh, I I know that you stayed there a little longer than I did, but I, I have nothing but fond memories uh, of my time there. So you kind of hit on a lot of my other typical introduction questions. So you talked about why you became an athletic trainer. What has kept you in athletic training? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I actually probably haven't thought about that as much as I should. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that there's something about the, the community and athletic training that I really, um, uh, sort of, uh, fits my personality and, and my wants and needs really, really well. Um, uh, you know, not to be, but I, I'm an only child. I don't have brothers and sisters. I didn't grow up in like a really tight, you know, uh, uh, community or, you know, big group of, of, uh, you know, family members that I, I grew up around. And so as I've gotten older, I've started to realize how important it is to have people around you who are, you know, working towards a similar cause or supportive or are there to listen or to, to lend a hand. And I think the one thing that I always see in athletic training, whether it's with clinicians that I work with here at Michigan State or community clinicians or researchers, is that uh, it's not competitive. Uh, despite the fact that the sports that we cover and the athletes we work with are extremely competitive, 
uh, athletic training is a community based field and we really try to help each other out the best we can, uh, in the ways that we know how to. And so, uh, you know, that feel and that ethic, I think is what's really, uh, kept me engaged, uh, over the long term. Um, and it's also just really great to work with young athletes who are really motivated to get better. Uh, and, you know, working with people who have, uh, the best interest of athletes at heart and are really trying to make sure that they're put in the best position to be successful, but also live uh, a healthy uh, lifestyle after they're done with competitive sports. Um, you know, those are all the things I research and they also happen to be the things that motivate athletic trainers when they get up in the morning. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I think we often think about what brings us to the profession and um, don't always think about and articulate why we stay, um, which obviously a lot of people stay. So absolutely. Um, There's a lot of good things. So you kind of went over where you've gone in your professional career, but can you talk about some of the highlights of your professional career and uh, maybe some of your accomplishments that you're most proud of? Sure. Yeah. Um, You know, it's interesting. You can think about like research accomplishments or professional accomplishments or personal. They're they're sort of all over the place. Um, You know, I, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is that I've been able to come to Michigan State and set up uh, uh, a lab and a research agenda that gives back to the community. Um, Here at Michigan State, uh, it's kind of standard of care for patients who go to MSU Sports Medicine to come to our lab for return to play assessments starting four months after surgery and going all the way up to two or three years after their surgery. And Um, being able to engage with a clinical population who's, you know, uh, 50% adolescent, 50% adult, but everyone's going through some challenges with their recovery, rehabilitation, and return to sport and provide them with information and guidance that's actually helping their clinical progression has been immensely satisfying for me as a, as a scholar. I think a lot of times we think of research labs as being, you know, uh, sort of, uh, antiseptic places that are, uh, lots of computers and people in glasses. I, I have glasses, but you know, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily fit the mold. Uh, and you know, a whole bunch of people who don't know how to talk to people. And, and we've built a community here at, at MSU. That's, that's the opposite of that. We're, we're really engaged in the community and making sure that patients are, are getting something, you know, positive from our, uh, from our group. Um, other than that, I mean, I, you know, we've won some poster awards and things like that over the last few years, but I, I don't tend to dwell on those all that long. Uh, I think it's more about what are we doing next or what's the exciting project or how are we helping people in the community that I get most excited about. So what I will say is I'll, I'll bump up my students a little bit. We've been extremely successful at the student level in uh, student grants from National Athletic Trainers Association, Great Lakes Athletic Trainers Association, American College of Sports Medicine over the last few years. Uh, and I've also been successful in placing my students in, in competitive you know, postdoctoral fellowships and stuff, actually both at the University of North Carolina. But uh, my students are, are outpacing me, and I'm sure they're going to be leaders in the field in the coming years. And so I think that's the thing I'm most proud of or excited about. I think, uh, like many athletic trainers, oftentimes the things we're proud of are what we do in other people. And um, it's definitely a reflection of your hard work. So um, well, we definitely recognize that. So you talked a little bit about some of the work that you're doing with these ACLR patients um, and how your lab and the community um, that you guys have created there intervenes in their lives. So over the years, there has been a lot of research on ACLR patients, but there still remains a lack of clarity on how to best treat, how to return them to sport, um, promote lifelong health. There still seems to be a lot of gray area. So can you discuss the biggest concerns relative to ACLR patients that you see and how these shape the interventions that we use in our patients? Yeah, absolutely. So um, over the the last three or four years, we've actually opened up a, a, a qualitative agenda in the lab. And so we've um, started to ask patients and parents and physical therapists directly about what are the things that are concerning you or that might be limitations in, in your engagement in the rehabilitation process. And through, I think we're we're just wrapping up our fourth study at this point, and I, we need to stop at some point because the, the results have just been the same in all the studies, uh, no matter who we ask or how far out from surgery they are. Um, and so I think the primary concern that I've currently got is really around patient education and knowledge. Uh, I think we assume that patients know a lot more than they actually do uh, after their injury. And a single uh, visit with their physician in the office prior to their surgery is probably not sufficient to give them the information that they need to be set up for success during the rehabilitation process. And so 
uh, what we found is just patients feel as though they don't understand what the key time points are or what the key physical hallmarks would be during the rehabilitation process. What's an acceptable amount of pain? How many, how much symptoms should I be expecting at given times during the rehabilitation process? And because of that, they go through the process very timidly. They feel uh, uncomfortable and nervous about it because they don't know what's coming next. Uh, and so as clinicians, especially in the rehabilitation space, whether it's, uh, you know, us as athletic trainers or physical therapists who are working with patients who have ACL reconstruction, you know, I think being a resource for them that not only tells them what we're doing today, but also gives them a short and long-term view about what's coming up, what they should expect, how they think, how we think they should be feeling versus how they're actually reporting feeling, you know, giving them some clarity about the process is one thing that I think, uh, really hasn't been investigated very much and, and would be beneficial for people to dive into. Um, I think the second thing that I've, I've noticed over the last few years or so is that the the brain-body connection is really becoming uh, a lot clearer in some ways and a little bit uh, more commonly integrated into planning of rehabilitation or planning of recovery after ACL reconstruction. Uh, we know that you can make a quad stronger by lifting heavier things. That's not a, a challenge. It's just a matter of whether or not you're going to provide patients with the opportunity to do that or, you know, support them in their, in their, uh, process of, you know, going and finding external resources to go do Olympic lifting or other forms of lifting. But the hard part is that, uh, just because you've got a strong quad doesn't mean you can use it functionally. And it doesn't mean that your brain is going to process the information around you to tell you that you should be using it during a, a specific task, a cut or a jump or a land. And so um, I look at work from uh, here at Michigan State, Shelby Baez is doing great work at uh, University of Ohio, Dusty Grooms is doing great work. And there are other investigators around the world who are working on this kind of brain body connection. And I think that's an area where we're going to see both um, uh, more feasible assessment approaches, but also interventional guidance uh, that's really clinically feasible, low cost, easy to do things you can actually integrate into your clinical practice over the next few years. Um, and I know this is a long answer, but the last thing would just be, I think long-term health is something that uh, patients are starting to become more aware of and that researchers and clinicians are also starting to, to consider a bit more uh, when providing uh, guidance for patients and rehabilitative approaches. So whether that's uh, the fact that we know that, you know, up to a third of patients are going to have radiographic arthritis at 10 years after surgery, which is much higher than the general population, or whether we know that, uh, I have a doctoral student here who's doing a study now. We just found that, you know, patients are gaining two to five kilograms of fat mass between, uh, time of surgery and six months after surgery. Uh, what are the long-term implications of that? Uh, you know, sort of not just from a, a cartilage perspective, but are there cardiac issues? Are there long-term mood disorder issues? Are people, be, you know, uh, starting to experience symptoms of depression or anxiety because of their rehabilitative process? Um, I think finding ways for us to, first of all, identify patients who are at risk and second of all, mitigate uh, the risk of long-term disease uh, during the rehabilitative process is kind of a, a must-have in the next few years. So the, you gave a lot of information there. Uh, so I have um, a, several follow-up questions kind of about, on different parts of those. Um, but I think one of the things that kind of ties all of those answers together is really the focus on individuals as people. You know, you didn't mention an athlete and we want to get them back to all-star status or, you know, whatever status that is. And I think um, I, I can definitely think about my own clinical practice or um, patients that I've seen and interacted with. And that always seems to be the goal is get back to sport. And we don't always think about these long-term um, things that, that really are what defines success as an individual. Yeah. So, I mean, especially for adolescent and young adult patients who are involved in organized sport, you know, uh, sports are their primary source of physical activity. And so sports are a great goal. Like there's nothing wrong with saying, I, I want my patient to get back to sports or the patient is motivated to get back to sports. And I want to facilitate that, uh, as a, as a goal for their rehabilitation. I think where we get in trouble is this one, we assume that every athlete that we work with, uh, a patient who is engaged in organized sport, uh, wants to go back to playing sports. And, and the answer just is that that's not the truth. Uh, you know, there's, there's probably in younger patients, 70 or 80% of patients want to, and in young adults, maybe it's slightly lower, but we sort of skip the point where we ask them what their, their values are and what they're hoping to do. 
And so I hope that as part of uh, sort of improving care for patients with ACL reconstruction as clinicians, step one is just ask the patient what they actually want, right? I know we don't think of it as a service-oriented industry. It, you know, it's not like we're working at the movie theater or something like that. But at the same point, the patient who's in front of you has come to you and asked for care to guide them towards their goals. And so we should be aware of what those goals are and work our best to facilitate that. And so what I focus on a lot of times is thinking about what are skills that I can give someone that will help them now, but will also translate to after they've finished their, their competitive sport career, or if they choose not to go back to sports, that will enable them to be physically active or reduce disease risk, regardless of whether they're engaging in sports. And so I think we can do both. You know, it's not a if then, it's both, <laughs> you know, and so, uh, you know, getting someone ready to play football on Saturday and also making sure they understand how much physical activity they should be engaging in or uh, what their body weight should look like after they're done with their career in order to mitigate disease risk. I think both of those things can happen if we're an informed and engaged clinician. So you have talked about some different um, things that we need to consider in our treatments. And as we continue to learn more and technology advances, we are able to use new tools and new technology for some novel approaches in treating, returning to sport, tracking these patients. I know the list is somewhat endless um, of, of different treatment approaches using new technologies, but can you maybe talk about three novel treatment approaches that you think have the greatest potential for changing patient care and long-term outcomes? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'll sort of reference back to the earlier really long answer I gave apologetically. But, uh, you know, I think those are areas that we can potentially provide some guidance using new interventional approaches. And so on the on the brain body side, I mean, the the advances that have occurred in app based mindfulness therapies or uh, other types of uh, interventions that focus on uh, improving mood state or, or sort of psychological response to injury are all over the place. I mean, if you listen to podcasts, which you're listening to one now, so you probably do, you know, you hear ads for things like talk space and you hear uh, things for calm and all these different kind of, you know, uh, counseling or, or mindfulness apps. And, and those are things that um, I think are going to become increasingly popular for, for integration into clinical care. It's not meant to be a replacement for a uh, patient engaging with a mental health professional, but, you know, there's a this sort of gray area where a patient could use a little booster uh, or a little bit of a support for their mental health during recovery where they may not need to see a counselor regularly, but, you know, engagement with a mindfulness app may be helpful in centering them to start their rehabilitation on a given day. And so something like that, I think, is uh, increasingly popular. The second is integration of virtual environments. So I think uh, use of low-cost virtual reality, uh, which is is uh, really inexpensive at this point to provide some stimulation and uh, guide the reconnection of that brain-body connection is something that we're going to see a lot of over the coming years. And again, if you go to a presentation by Dusty or or by Shelby, I think you'll you'll learn a lot more about that than I'll be able to <laughs> give you information about. But the third and the thing that I know more about is wearables. And so I think uh, using commercially available and kind of more medical grade or research grade uh, uh, wearables is is something that is already starting to be integrated at the college athletic level with catapult and other kind of wearables that athletes are using to monitor their, their training loads, uh, or, you know, the intensity of their activity. But, you know, I, I'm more into the idea of like, let's use an Apple watch or a Fitbit and see what kind of information we can get out of it to one, assess how a patient's doing, but two, also start to provide some interventions that can carry with a patient after they've left your, your rehabilitative care. Uh, and so, yeah, those would be, I think three areas, there's plenty more, but those would be three that I think we're really seeing consistent growth in those areas over the last few years. Well, for the rest of the podcast, we're primarily going to focus on some of the stuff relative to wearables. Um, but before really getting into talking about that, um, I do want to ask you to talk a little bit about the importance of physical activity, specifically in ACLR patients. And I think we all know the importance of physical activity in general human life. Um, but, you know, why is this such an area of emphasis in these ACLR patients uh, that, that we really need to start to, to work to identify how to promote this? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that I think we assume our patients know that physical activity is important and they don't. Uh, And so, you know, we may have had a really good professor at some point, or maybe we've just been curious and have looked up physical activity guidelines or what counts as physical activity because we're healthcare professionals and we care about it. But I think if you talk to a typical 17 or 18 year old and you ask them, you know, how much physical activity should you do and what counts as physical activity? uh, Most of them have no clue. There's something like 8% of uh, adolescents in America can provide you with a, a even close to guesstimation of what their physical activity guidelines should be. So I think that's the foundation of where we're starting, right? So we've got these adolescents and young adults who maybe don't quite have a handle on physical activity. And then they experience a traumatic injury that takes them away from being able to do moderate and vigorous physical activity. So moderate physical activity would be things like a really fast paced walk that gets your heart rate elevated or cycling or, you know, sort of recreational exercises. Vigorous would be more like sport related activities that get you sweating and your heart rate really elevated and um, you're kind of burning more, more calories in order to be able to execute those activities. And so for like an adult, you're supposed to do 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. And for kids, it should be 60 minutes per day in order to be classified as, as physically active. And so we've got people who are between 13 and 30 who are getting hurt. They don't know their physical activity needs, and then they're removed from physical activity, or at least their primary source of physical activity, sports, because they've had their sport related knee injury. And then they do rehabilitation, which for most people is in an outpatient clinic setting, or maybe they work with their high school athletic trainer a bit, but they're, you know, sort of bridging the gap between outpatient and and AT services. And during PT, we're focused on things like balance and range of motion, muscle strength, maybe some physical performance metrics like hopping or jumping, but there's not a lot of uh, focus put on sort of cardiovascular activity, right? Like aerobic exercise, running or cycling or rowing or, you know, kind of things that would be good for heart health. And then they get done with rehab and often they either go back to sport for a short period of time or they don't go back to sport and they don't have their primary source of physical activity anymore, which was sports, and they don't have any tools that are helping them to understand what would be healthy for them to participate in. And so we've done a bunch of studies over the last three or four years to look at whether or not people with ACL reconstruction are physically active. Uh, and pretty much across the board, we found that within five years of surgery, um, patients are doing significantly less physical activity than healthy individuals of the same age and sex and patient reported physical activity level. Um, We found that uh, women tend to be less physically active than men after ACL reconstruction. Um, We found that women tend to, to gain more fat mass after ACL reconstruction, and it's related to their physical activity patterns. And I'm actually, as we were getting ready to jump on the call today, I was working on a paper that's going to get submitted today, that adolescent patients are significantly less physically active after ECL reconstruction than adult patients are. And so that's where it sort of came from is is that we're seeing these patterns of behavior that are would not be good in a healthy individual. And they're being amplified by the fact that a patient's got four, six or nine months of off time while they're in rehabilitation, and they don't seem to be coming back to physical activity at the same level. Um, And so back to your really initial point, you know, physical activity is important for cardiovascular health. It's good for mood. It's good for cognition. It's good for physical performance or strength. I mean, there's a million different things that physical activity is good for. It's good to prevent disease like cancer and heart disease. It's helpful in maintaining cartilage health. Uh, Any indicator that you can pretty much come up with that would be an indicator of good health for a young person. Physical activity is, is helpful in promoting that. And so the fact that we have this experience early in the lifespan that occurred during sports that then makes people potentially less physically active is is concerning to me and something that we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out. So your previous research on identifying sort of this inactivity um, that we see in patients, which might be due to not knowing fear, pain, disinterest, whatever the case may be, we see that oftentimes these ACL patients are more physically inactive. So this really prompted your most recent study where you start where you evaluated the feasibility of using wearables as an intervention to promote um, and track physical activity. So can you just give us a short summary of this study and your results? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we, uh, I'm fortunate enough here at Michigan State to work with a computer scientist who uh, helps me to, to build kind of interventions and use wearables to, to do so. And so we put together uh, an intervention based on some, some previous literature on physical activity promotion, and it was based around trying to enhance uh, step counts in patients who had had an ACL reconstruction. And so the way the intervention works is that we use a patient's own data from the previous 10 days to set a, a kind of an adjustable goal. Uh, and so it's not something as simple as just 10,000 steps a day or 12,000 steps a day. It's meant to kind of modify itself as um, as your physical activity patterns change. And so uh, that's supposedly a good thing. Adjustable goals are better than static goals. Um, but we enrolled 12 patients who had had ACL reconstruction. It was a really uh, heterogeneous group. They had had ACL reconstruction as soon as I think seven months was our, our soonest and all the way out to six or seven years after ACL reconstruction, because this was really proof of concept. We were just trying to see whether or not uh, patients would do what we asked them to do. We didn't even really focus on whether or not it, it helped promote physical activity. We just wanted to see how often would they look at the goals, how often would they meet the goals, would they wear their monitor every day. And so then we gave patients a Fitbit, and we just monitored their activity with no goals for 28 days, and we saw how many days they actually wore the monitor and uh, whether or not they stayed engaged with the study. And then after 28 days, if they had been compliant with the monitor wear period, which I think we defined as 21 of 28 days or something like that, uh, we then uh, kind of switched them over into goal setting. And so every morning at 8 a.m., they got a text message that uh, gave them a step goal for the day and said, you know, please try to attain this many steps today. Uh, you can monitor your steps directly on the Fitbit. And, um, and then the hope was that, uh, you know, that would help to kind of set them an individualized goal for the for the period of time. And so what we found is that patients like wearing a Fitbit, 11 out of the 12 patients were compliant uh, and compliance was over 90% for both the observation period and for the, the goal setting period. Um, and we found that uh, about half of the patients, especially patients who started with lower step counts, uh, saw an improvement of their quality of life over the period of the study while wearing the wearable and getting goals. Uh, and then we found that patients who started with lower step counts, so step counts below 10,000, were more likely to see an improvement in their in their daily step counts over the course of the intervention than patients who had already had a relatively high step count, uh, you know, 10 to 14,000 steps per day, which totally makes sense, right? If you're already doing a lot of steps, it's kind of hard to continue to increase your steps beyond a certain point. Um, and then the funniest finding that we had was just that um, when we designed the study, you know, we designed an eight-week study, and then we happened to start it kind of early in the fall semester. And uh, all 12 of our patients had either Thanksgiving or finals in week seven and week eight of uh, of our study. And so if you look at the paper, there's a graph that shows the physical activity patterns, and you can just see that they fall off a cliff uh, in the last week of our, our study. And it was because people were at home eating turkey or they were taking finals. So uh, don't, don't run a study that runs that way uh, in the future. So this research found a lot of promise in this intervention, but also demonstrated some challenges with implementation and adherence um, besides just Thanksgiving and exams. Uh, so how did these lessons learned translate to important points for you to consider in future research, but also that um, clinicians could use as guidelines for clinical practice? Yeah, apps, um, lots of things, but I think there's a few key ones. So the first is that um, I think uh, providing patients up front with an understanding of why we're asking them to do what they're doing. You know, we just sort of gave people a Fitbit and said, wear it for 28 days, and then we would set some goals, and, and then we'll see how you're doing at the end. But we never really gave them a clear understanding of why we were doing this. Uh, and so we're, we're in the process of starting up a pilot study now that also incorporates patient education along with a, a similar intervention that's we've, we've progressed the intervention a little bit, but incorporates patient intervention al or education along with the intervention. And that came directly from talking to patients who had been in the previous study. You know, they got to the end and said, like, it was great that I got a Fitbit out of this and you paid me a little money to do it. But I don't understand really why I was doing this. And so uh, we're hoping that providing upfront education along with the intervention could be beneficial official. Um, the second thing that we noticed is just we weren't really flexible to the patient's um, 
schedule or to the patient's sort of desire uh, around communication. And so we texted everyone at the same time every day. Uh, but it turned out that some patients had really different schedules. Uh, we had some patients who got up really early to get to school or get to a job. And by the time they got their goal, they were already at work and may have forgotten to wear their Fitbit that day because they didn't get a text message at a early enough time to remember or, you know, to remind them. Or we had some patients say, hey, it might be nice to get a reminder like in the afternoon before I go to the gym or before I'm going to go do my exercise because it would be more likely to stick with me and I would be more likely to get on the treadmill for a few minutes um, in order to uh, you know make my steps up for the day and so I think interacting with your patient and understanding you know when are you planning to do activity and and sort of what types are you planning uh, could be helpful in making sure that the goal uh, gets to them when they need it and it's also consistent with something that they might be able to achieve um, and then I think the last thing that we, we found is just that um, uh, friction is the enemy of a, of a good intervention. So if, if your patient normally uses an Apple Watch, but you're going to deliver the intervention on a Fitbit, um, patients get annoyed. They like wearing their Apple Watch, right? They bought it for a reason. All, all their life is integrated into their watch. And so trying to find ways to meet patients where they already are instead of trying to pull them away from the thing that they're comfortable with and then you know, setting up this new norm for them, uh, especially around wearables and things that they're already engaged with, uh, is something that we're working through now. So it turns out it's really hard to build an intervention that runs on all the different watch brands at the same time, but we're working on it. We're hoping to get there soon enough. But as a clinician, you know, uh, all the watches provide the same metrics, the heart rate, uh, step count, uh, minutes of physical activity per day. And so, you know, from your end of the spectrum, it should be actually pretty easy to be able to pull those metrics off or at least, you know, ask a patient, what was your step count yesterday or what was your physical activity uh, yesterday? For us, it's hard because we have to, like, you know, deliver these goals every day and they have to get there somehow. So we have to have computer code that lets us do that. But, you know, clinically, you know, meet the patient where they are. I think that's a much better way to go about it than trying to force a new technology or monitor on them. So throughout the podcast today, you've talked about several upcoming projects um, that you are working on in this area. So I know you are busy, um, but are there, is there anything else that you want to tell us about kind of where you're going with your research agenda? Yeah, I think um, the big thing that we're looking to do, we have two two main efforts currently. One is to just make the intervention um, uh, more automated and less uh, less frustrating for patients. So we, we, we've developed a new system where the text messages and all the other things related to the intervention are delivered uh, automatically. So we don't have to have a researcher every morning getting up at seven in the morning to send text messages. Um, but in doing so, we're also able to allow patients to tell us when they want their messages and how frequently they want their messages, whether they want reminders for certain stuff or whether they don't want reminders for certain stuff. Like, you know, if they're battery life on their monitor is bad or something like that. Do they want a reminder or are they going to, you know, would that be annoying to them and they would prefer to just figure it out on their own? Uh, and so we're trying to find ways to be as, um, aware and as understanding of, of a patient's needs and, and treat them where they are instead of making them come to us, you know, for the treatment that we think they need. Um, and then the second thing is we're, we're really trying to figure out a way to integrate social support and psychological support into the intervention. So, um, we're in brainstorm phase right now, but we're, we're looking at some ways to build small communities of, of similar patients. So maybe age and sex or, or sport related communities uh, of patients who have had similar injury and enable them to do kind of uh, physical activity goal setting and attainment together. You know, so it, it's sort of like a, a jogging group or a, you know, a cycling group that you might go to in your community because you, you want to meet new people and do the sport that you like. Well, we may not be able to do that exactly, but is there a way for us to team people up, you know, in an app or on a platform where they can compete or be supportive or whatever is their best kind of approach to, to helping other people be physically active? And so, um, yeah, those are our two kind of main pushes currently, and I'm excited about both. Well, I look forward to seeing the results of that come out and how it impacts the patients that we treat, because I think this research is very applicable to patient care. Um, and, you know, you talked about that at the beginning of one of the things of why you stayed in athletic training. And I think you've really been intentional in designing a research line that, that focuses on the patient. 
So in addition to your research responsibilities and all the research that you do, you are also the digital applications editor for the Journal of Athletic Training. Um, so can you tell us about what this entails and uh, maybe how people could get involved if they're interested? Um, uh, when uh, Jay Hurdle became the editor-in-chief of JAT a few years ago, I, I think he's in his third year now, uh, one of the things that he proposed as a key kind of pillar of his time as editor-in-chief was the integration of social media and other digital platforms uh, into the journal. Because prior to today, there had been some attempts and, and some things had been successful and other things had been less successful, but there hadn't really been a consistent uh, position that had been made in order to have you know one person whose focus was to make sure that we were digitally represented. Uh, and so uh, once he uh, was uh, given the role of editor-in-chief, he asked me if I would be interested in doing it. I think it was because I tweet too much or I used to tweet too much. I don't have really time to tweet that much anymore, but, um, uh, I took over the role and, uh, we've just been able to kind of do things through trial and error. So we've, uh, built some, uh, podcasts like this one and, uh, uh JAT chat and JAT cast, uh, that are out on a monthly basis. We've, uh, started, uh, more regularly posting on Twitter, Facebook, and now Instagram is, uh, our new kind of target, uh, to, to be more active and engaged on. We have a really vibrant uh, YouTube channel that brings all of these things together. So if you go on YouTube and search Journal of Athletic Training, our, our channel has all of our podcast and live video content that's there for streaming. Uh, and then in the upcoming year, we should have uh, increased volume of uh, infographics and, and uh, visual abstracts that will be posted to both the Journal of Athletic Training website and also be available through PubMed and other search services. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a lot. I have some really great people that I work with. Lizzie, it's great to work with you and, and Luke Donovan and Kara Radzik on the podcast side. Uh, Colby Mangum is a, a great, uh, unbelievable teammate uh, when it comes to social media posting and, and visual stuff. Haley Root from AT Still University really helps with some of the visual media as well. Um, but if you're interested in getting involved, we're always looking for helpers, uh, uh, whether it's for editing podcasts or helping to build visual abstracts or uh, just be a co-host on a podcast. Uh, on two of our podcasts, we love to have clinicians come in and be a, a voice of reason, uh, because normally when researchers get together, the, co the conversation goes off the rails pretty quickly. Uh, and so having some clinicians to bring us back down to, to the ground and actually have a conversation about how to help a patient is really important. Um, if you're interested in any of that, uh, you can email us at uh, jatsocialmedia at gmail.com, or you can email me directly at uh, uh, well, you can go to my MSU uh, website. My, my email address is a little complicated. But uh, if you find me on Twitter or Facebook, you can uh, shoot me a DM or a message. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk to people and see if there's a role that would uh, fit well with your current schedule, your skill set, or, or, or whatever you think you can bring to the journal. So I imagine Chris will probably edit this out later, but um, he does do an amazing job on editing the podcast and organizing us all. Um, uh, those of us that host the podcast are all faculty members, just like Chris, but um, he's constantly having to wrangle us and remind us and coordinate for us. Um, and he lives behind the screen. So I don't think everybody realizes all the work that Chris puts in and, and that he has learned to do um, for this role. Not that he had the the skills before, um, but he had the capacity and interest in learning and wanting to help. Um, and so I, I really think actually your work that you do with the digital applications also kind of goes along with some of the, your research stuff that you talked about that really in the end, your focus is always on what's best for the end user. And I think that's clear in um, your service work and your research. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your help and, and you're definitely welcome uh, on that point. Yeah. I mean, I, that's my one take home from being the digital editor. The thing I've learned more than anything else is that if, if you can find someone where they already are, you're way more likely to have a positive interaction than if you uh, force them to try to come to what you think they should be doing or where they should be. Uh, it, it's unlikely that they're going to stay engaged. And I, I think that applies to clinical practice, research and digital editing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's really been something that's changed my research agenda through, you know, this service opportunity that I've been working on. So. So I know you just gave us that take home point on a digital applications editor, but um, I want to open it up if you have any other take home points that you think the listeners should know from this discussion. 
I think the thing that I, every time I talk to clinicians out, out in the world, uh, which this last year has been something that I haven't been able to do very much and it's been frustrating for me, but, um, is the, the thing that we hear from patients the most is that the first interaction that you have with a patient is the most important by far. There's no other time that you'll have a more captive audience and that someone's going to be judging you more about your approach to interacting with them. And, and the, clinicians who are empathetic and take time to listen to the patient, right? Uh, I am a horrible person at cutting people off sometimes. And I've really, over the last few years, tried to cut down on that because I've started to understand in talking to patients and parents how debilitating that can be during the middle of a conversation. Uh, a patient's trying to tell you what their biggest struggle is or what's the thing that's keeping them out of the activity they love or what's making them feel isolated or anxious. And, and cutting them off in the middle of talking to them about that makes them feel less than or less valued you than they than they should as as someone who's going through a really traumatic time in their life and so i think that that first intake interview has the ability to set you off on a course where a patient's going to have an unbelievably successful rehabilitation experience or it has the opportunity to set you off on a course where you're going to have resistance and 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 you're going to have a patient who's not as engaged and not as trustful as you or, or with you as they could have been otherwise and so um, that would be the first thing. And then the second would be just like, don't be afraid to try new things. So if a patient is wearing an Apple watch and they're coming into the clinic and, uh, you know, they're getting towards the end of the rehabilitation, uh, process, there's nothing wrong with asking them, do they use a goal setting app? Do they set goals on their Apple watch? Do they know how much physical activity they should get based on the metrics that are coming in through the Apple watch, you know, teach them to use the tools they already have. Uh, and so they have a skill set that they'll kind of take, uh, well beyond the time that they've spent with you in the clinic. Um, I, I think those are two things that, you know, kind of a beginning of the process and end of the process bookends that I think are really important as we're engaging with these patients. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, your research on behalf of the patients that ultimately will benefit for it and your work that you do with the journal of athletic training. Thanks, Lizzie. It was a pleasure. I hope you all found this podcast informative and that you can utilize the clinical recommendations to improve patient care. I also want to reiterate Chris's point that if you have an interest in helping with digital applications, to please reach out to him um, through one of the various ways that he indicated you could contact him. And that is it for today's The AT Tapes. Please remember to rate and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please follow the Journal of Athletic Training on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at JAT underscore NATA on all three platforms. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join us for next month's episode of the AT Tapes.